Can you hear me? Yes, is, okay, all right. Well, apologies for the technical difficulties, everybody. Let me go ahead and, and uh, get started. My name is Jorge Ancona. I'm the Assistant Vice Chancellor for Alumni Engagement and Executive Director of the UCR Alumni Association. Thank you again for taking time out of your busy schedules uh, to join us this evening. Just a quick reminder that this um, uh, webinar is being recorded so that uh, we can have it uh, for viewing at a later date. So just wanted you to be aware that that's the reason why this is being recorded. At the same time, I do wanna encourage you as, as the presentation goes, if there's any specific questions that you might have, please be sure uh, to put those in the Q&A. Um, let me just talk a little bit about um, this program this evening. While we all wish we could gather in person um, and we're very much looking forward to getting to that point in the not too distant future, we're also very pleased to continue to offer programs which feature the cutting edge research that is taking place at UCR and also as an opportunity for us to showcase our faculty. So on behalf of the UCR Alumni Association and its board of directors, and in partnership with the Marlin and Rosemary Bournes College of Engineering, welcome to tonight's presentation entitled Stopping the Clock to Save Lives. Tonight's program will consist of three presenters by members of our own faculty, followed by a question and answer session that will be facilitated by Professor Guillermo Aguilar. So let me begin by introducing some of our, uh, introducing the, the faculty presenters uh, that will be speaking uh, this evening. Professor Aguilar is both a professor and chair of mechanical engineering and has applied his interest in heat transfer to develop cryogenic spray cooling, which reduces heat injury to healthy tissue by cooling it before laser treatment of unhealthy tissue. He has also developed new techniques for laser assisted cryosurgery and developed a leading research program on laser induced cavitation which explores the use of laser produced bubbles to deliver therapeutic drugs into tissues. Professor Aguilar invested, investigated what kind of bone would benefit from a new transparent uh, ceramic based on zirconia to create the window to the brain implants produced by densifying utra stabilized zirconia nanopowder into a bulk ceramic material. The project received a $5 million grant funding from the National Science Foundation's Partnership in Internal Research and Education Program and Mexico's National Council of Science and Technology. In 2019, he was inducted into the National Academy of Engineering of Mexico. Professor Yandong Yin, who is a professor of chemistry, is interested in the synthesis, assembly, and functionalization of nanostructures for creating novel catalytic electronic magnetic and phototonic materials. He, has also, he also uses these nanostructured materials to design smart devices with optical, chemical, and mechanical responses for robotic and biomedical application. His recent recognitions include Cotro Scholar Award, DuPont Young Professor Grant, NSF Career Award, NMLH Research, Research Award Fellow of Royal Society of Chemistry, and Materials Research Society Fellow. Being recognized as one of the world's most highly cited researchers by Clarivate Analytics from 2014 to 2020. He is currently an associate editor of the Journal of Materials Chemistry C and also serves on the editorial board for many international journals such as Advanced Functional Materials, Nano Letters, Research and Chemical Reviews. And la last but not least, we're also going to hear from Associate Professor and Faculty Graduate Advisor of Mechanical Engineering Material Science and Engineering Program, Lorenzo Mangolini. Professor Mangolini's research interests lie at the intersection of plasma and material science. His group develops new functional materials for energy and bio-related applications. He is the recipient of the NSF Career Award, the Department of Energy Early Career Research Program Award, and the 3M non-tenured faculty award. He has authored and co-authored 60 peer-reviewed articles filed from more than 10 invention disclosure and, grad and graduated seven PhD student students while at UCR. He is also an entrepreneur. In 2019, he co-founded Silion Incorporated, a Riverside-based startup that aims at commercializing new advanced materials for lithium-ion battery market. 
It is now my pleasure to turn the program over to Professor Aguilar, who will provide an overview of the work that is being planned for UCR's Advanced Technologies for the Preservation of Biological Systems, a new $26 million National Science Foundation funded engineering research center. Professor Aguilar, take it away. Thank you, Jorge. Thanks for that uh, nice introduction. So first of all, let me start by sharing my screen. Uh, I hope everybody can see it. Okay, um, so let me um, let, let me start with a brief introduction of what this center is about. Um, as Jorge just mentioned, um, this is an NSF ERC, uh, which stands for Engineering Research Center. And as you can tell from uh, just looking at the at the uh, 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 the logos that appear here at the very front page were um, a part of a consortium of, of um, high education institutions and we're in good company. This is, this is a program that is run by four uh, main academic institutions, the University of Minnesota, California Berkeley, MGH, which is part of Harvard, and of course, uh, UC Riverside. Uh, let me start by telling you what, what this center is all about. Um, first, I, I believe that one of the reasons we were successful, we were four, uh, one of four uh, engineering research centers that was, was uh, sponsored by NSF in the past iteration. And one of the reasons I believe we, re we were able to be successful is that uh, we were able to recognize that there are many societal benefits that this center is going to provide. Uh, you, as you can see in this, uh, we call it the wheel of fortune, um, all the way from perhaps cell therapies that will allow us for, for develop, the development of drugs of tomorrow, um, the transplantable, transplantable tissue and organs, which is perhaps one of the uh, uh, more common kind of uh, ideas that comes to mind when we talk about the possibility of freezing and then uh, delivering tissues and organs to uh, patients that might need them, but all the way through drug discovery, uh, uh, banking on transgenic lines of, um, uh, of animals that may be important for developing new disease models, helping with the biodiversity of, of especially of certain uh, species that are in, in, um, uh, extinct, getting extinguished by the uh, climate change, uh, uh, creating uh, more seeds to grow important aquaculture species year round rather than just depending on their uh, normal uh, mating and proliferation times. Uh, banking on tissues and, and, and bio dressings that may allow us or may allow doctors to uh, cope with mass casualties, uh, for example, during peacetime needs, all the way to uh, improving trauma uh, at the battlefield and in injury stabilization during space travel. So as you can see, it's a very, very wide range of societal benefits that this center is aiming at having. And one of the reasons, again, what, why I think this center was successful is because in line with what NSF has been promoting for quite some time, we have managed to convey the, the notion that this is a convergent engineering and science center, meaning that there's a whole variety of topics that, or, or uh, uh, sub-disciplines, if you will, within the engineering, as well as within the sciences that come together to try to solve uh, overarching challenges that allow us for the, stopping the biological clock. So uh, there's, there's barriers, for example, to the proper way in which we want to uh, uh, freeze these, these uh, uh, tissues or, or cells or organisms uh, in a way that we, um, we later are able to bring them back from what we call suspended animation. Now, an effort like this, multi-million dollar effort, um, uh, 25 plus million, if I'm um, not mistaken, can only take place when you have a very cohesive team of people working together. So what you can see in this slide is the very many researchers that are part of this effort. Here at the bottom, you can see uh, what we call the thrust areas. These are the, the, the PIs collaborating 
in the three main thrust areas that I will talk about in a minute. Uh, we're all doing work that eventually will get tested in what we call test beds. And then there's also a very important group of researchers who are helping with another important component of, of many of these uh, research efforts uh, sponsored by NSF, which have to do with inclusion, uh, workforce development, innovation, ethics, and regulation. All in all, we are uh, 32 faculty members uh, and even three others that are at different institutions, not the main institutions that I, I talked about before. Um, this is very busy. I'm not going to spend too much time on this, but uh, this is uh, the way in which NSF wants to see uh, the applications for these very large programs. They talk about the, the multi-layered or the three-layered uh, chart where um, the proposers are supposed to to convey the notion of the knowledge base that will be obviously at the basis of what the center will do. Uh, <clears throat> there's gonna be some fundamental insights that will um, provide support for technology base. And here's where the thrust areas that we're part of come into play. And then all of that will be the support of the te technology integration. And here's where all those test beds which are, uh, you know, as you can tell, associated with the length scales of the, uh, of the problems that we're addressing all the way from cells to microphysiological systems, whole organs, and even organisms. Um, all of these are going to be uh, supported on the enabling technologies that are afforded by the development of these thrust areas. UCR is having a major important role within what we call thrust area three which is the one that deals with the rapid and uniform warming of all these systems that have been cryopreserved and put in, into the suspended animation uh, status. Uh, on the right side, what you see is what we call the innovation ecosystem, which is another important component of a center of this kind. Again, because uh, you need to have a very close connection with educational efforts. Uh, and of course, in, in this day and age with the culture of inclusion, also with, with the development of workforce, uh, both at the uh, undergraduate level as well as the graduate level, there's many, very many stakeholders that are always part of this, this group. And then dealing with these kind of systems, dealing with this kind of uh, potential uh, transplant of organs and many other live species, you must have a very strong team in terms of ethics and policy, which is also part of this center. Um, so going into the thrust area three, which is what we're, um, uh, looking at uh, at UCR mostly. This, this slide gives you the, the notion of the very many different types of, of uh, species or, or, or uh, biological systems that we're trying to address. Um, we're, um, as we're gonna elaborate in a minute, there's a variety of um, scientific and technological approaches that we're um, using in order to bring back from these suspended animation mammalian cells um, larvae, uh, even uh, whole species like zebrafish and Pacific white shrimp. Um, also within, um, in, or in order to make this possible within the thrust area three, an important component of it is the development of new nanomaterials. And uh, my colleagues, Professor Mangolini and, and Professor Yin will tell you more about it. Um, and we use these nanomaterials, particularly nanoparticles in order to create localized uh, and, and more uh, uniform heating of many of these biological systems. Uh, and again, depending on the scale of these systems, we depend either on optical techniques of the kind that uh, my students and I work on in my lab, um, or we depend on other magnetic uh, um, uh, induction kind of heating that, that is needed for the larger, larger uh, scales. Uh, so in summary, the, the research that, that will come uh, out of all, all this center is really uh, a very well integrated one that has these thrust, three thrust areas uh, uh, working con uh, continuously with these test beds, uh, developing a whole variety of new science and technological uh, advances, and then supported by, by uh, very many uh, 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 well-known techniques and technologies that we use in isolation for many other problems 
but in this case, they all come together in order to support uh, the center efforts. Uh, like I said before, it is very important that to recognize that for NSF and for the kind of things that we do as academics, uh, um, uh, integrating educational efforts is key. Uh, there's a very deliberate effort to increase the diversity in STEM. And as you can tell from this chart, there's the recognition that between the universities that are participating, there's different percentages of underrepresented minority students uh, that, that we are serving. But together, as a whole, we can uh, help bring those numbers up across the board. Um, there's efforts all the way from K through 12 to the postdoc level. Uh, each of the institutions has some programs already uh, ongoing. In particular, for example, UCR has one with the Society for Hispanic Professional Engineers. It's called Via de Ciencias, where uh, a lot of uh, students have their first exposures to the STEM field. And that's how we gradually uh, uh, bring them up all the way from, uh, from K through 12 through the, through the academic ranks. Uh, there's also recognition that uh, even though the projected increase in the market, say for areas such as biomedical engineering uh, in 2020 was projected to be really, really large, um, there's a very leaky pipe in, in terms of of uh, providing the number of students that are needed in order to satisfy this kind of uh, market or this kind of technology field, uh, because there's ma very many that are lost all the way from elementary school till they, they make it all the way to the undergraduate level. So there's so many efforts also trying to improve uh, this to sort of patch those, those leaks, so to speak, so that we can get more students uh, all the way up. Um, <clears throat> These four institutions, like I said at the beginning, they're very well known uh, in their own right. Uh, we're leaders in, in a whole variety of, uh, of aspects. Uh, uh, Minnesota is well known for being at the center of very many biomedical uh, research companies. Uh, as you know, um, UCR is, is uh, number one in, in social mobility. And there's also uh, some key areas of the development that that we have been able to, to, uh, you know, uh, to uh, bring to the forefront. Uh, Berkeley, well, uh, another public university that, that's ranked very high. And then of course, MGH, Harvard um, uh, also has one of the best hospitals in the nation. At the graduate and the postdoc level, um, we're also bringing in a lot to the table because fortunately, uh, uh, some of the co-PIs at UCR, Professor Mangolini and I, started with a program called uh, um, NSF PIR that Jorge mentioned briefly at the beginning, which consists precisely on collaborative work with uh, various institutions in Mexico. And in doing so, we recognized that the exchange program of students at the graduate level and even at the postdoc level has a lot of uh, added value to very large programs like this one PIR or the one we're talking about today, the ERC Center. So using the experiences from that, uh, that program, we also uh, uh, brought to this new ERC the idea that there, there's gonna be quite a bit of flow of students in between the participating institutions so that they also have the exposure to many of the techniques and the labs and the collaborations that are taking place in each of the, of the participating institutions. In terms of the innovation ecosystem, um, we're also very, proud to, to know that each institution has their own leaders that are, uh, are helping create this ecosystem that is so much needed to make these efforts uh, possible. Particularly at UCR, we have Rosivel Ochoa, who's, who's even an associate vice chancellor, uh, uh, helping us lead all those uh, uh, technology development efforts as part of the ecosystem. Um, here's just a bit of a track record of the four institutions in terms of commercialization. Um, not so surprisingly, there's plenty to show for at Minnesota and MGH as well as, as Berkeley. UCR has a, a, a shorter uh, uh, story, if you will, and, and it's showing really well. It's already the uh, i -Corp side, uh, um, national i -Corp side uh, for a few years already, and uh, has had very uh, many successes with some startups. Um, 
there's a, a lot of commercialization activities by many of the ATP bio faculty. And this is just an example of the startups uh, that have licensed some of the agreements uh, through uh, their own institutions. And, uh, and clearly this was something that NSF recognized as a, as a good track record. And um, finally, in, in terms of the um, innovation ecosystem, you can tell from, from this graph, there's, there's a, um, a good projection in terms of what is going to be the, the size of the market, if you will, in terms of, of uh, technologies like regener regenerative medicine, uh, organs on a chip as well. Uh, the aquaculture that I briefly mentioned, but uh, that is also key for the thrust area three that we're going to talk about today, that, that is just showing uh, continuous growth, uh, not just in, in the US, but across the world. And, and then again, in terms of the so, uh, organs and tissue transplants, you can tell in this graph, there's the projection or the projections all the way up to 2017 was that many more people would would be in the waiting list for many of these organs for transplants that that we're obviously trying to to uh, uh, you know help bring to to a reality with these kind of technologies. Uh, so finally, that this is the last slide I have for the intro. One of the reasons this program was uh, uh, again I think I think very very attractive to NSF is that there are very many uh, partners. We call them partners. Very many companies that bought into this kind of idea that are already participating both with in cash and in kind contributions to the to the development of this center they are stakeholders uh, of the success of this center and um, we're only expecting this to grow uh, with time so um, i hope this was not too long and i hope I, I this gives you a good idea for what the the center is about just in a, in a nutshell. And now um, I think I will pass this on to my colleague Lorenzo Mangolini to tell you a little bit about the uh, area of research that he takes care of within the Thrust Area 3. Yeah, thank you, Guillermo. Thank you, Jorge. And uh, thank you, everyone, for, uh, for attending this uh, brief presentation. It's brief. Uh, Guillermo told for half an hour, but the original presentation was much longer than that. So <laughs> it, it was just a, a snippet of all that has gone into this grant. Uh, so I'll, I'll, I just have three quick slides uh, describing the um, contribution of my lab to um, this project. And uh, while I'm, hold on a second, I'm trying to get my PowerPoint to behave which I cannot, um, almost there. Sorry, there we go. Yeah, I think you should be able to see my first slide here. Uh, my contribution to this uh, very large project comes uh, is about nanoparticle and nanomaterial design. And of course, when it comes to therapeutics, uh, you have nanoparticles in all sorts of, sort of applications already. You can use nanoparticles for uh, uh, chemotherapeutics. You can use nanoparticles for radiotherapy. Photodynamic treatment, which is a close relative of what we are doing in this project, meaning shining light onto tissue. You put a lot of particles in this tissue and you release all sorts of chemicals from the particles to treat the tissue, immunotherapy and so on. And really you have a, a huge, very wide umbrella, a very wide range of families, but there is really one common features. What we are trying to do, we are trying to design materials that interact very strongly with light, meaning that you shine a laser, uh, uh, preferentially in the near infrared range, uh, and this laser then excites some sort of activity into the nanomaterial. And the name of the game here is really designing the nanomaterial in the appropriate way to do what you want to do. And the reason why you use near infrared light is because tissue is, uh, so to speak, semi-transparent to near infrared light. It's right at the edge of the visible range. You cannot see with your naked eye near infrared light, but that near infrared light actually can penetrate quite deeply into tissue. 
Um, and for this particular application, uh, what we are trying to do, we are trying to use these nanomaterials to rewarm tissue very rapidly. So you cool down your tissue to cryogenic temperature, you vitrify it, uh, and people more or less know how to do that, but all, that's only half of the battle, right? Because once you have your cryopreserved tissue, you need to be able to bring it back up to room temperature and have tissue that is still viable. Have an organ like a liver or a kidney that is still can still be trans transplanted and save somebody's life. Or for the case of zebrafish, you want your free, you want to freeze these tiny embryos and then you want to rewarm them and then have them grow into healthy tissue that then you can you know, farm and uh, sell to the market. Um, the gold standard, uh, I apologize for the pun here, the, the gold standard is actually gold. The best material to really interact strongly with light in this application is gold. Uh, you can make these nice nano rods and by tuning the properties, you can tune how strongly they interact with light. And uh, that's where my research comes in, because as you can imagine, uh, there is a clear problem with gold. Gold is a very expensive and uh, not exactly abundant material. And especially if you want to grow this technology to a very large industry that can support um, especially applications like aqua farming and so on, uh, it becomes difficult to foresee that we will be able to sustain that just by sticking a lot of gold nano rods in a lot of uh, fish embryos. You need to come up with something else, something that is abundant, that is sustainable, but still has properties which are really similar to gold. And, and that's the contribution of my group. My group has been focusing for a few years on this material called titanium nitrate. Uh, many of you maybe have seen it. If you go to Home Depot, you can buy all these drill bits uh, which have a gold looking coating, uh, but that is not gold. Uh, gold does not have good mechanical properties. That is titanium nitrate. It's a very hard ceramic, which also has the very interesting property of having, uh, behaving really similar to gold from an optical point of view. So the, the difficulty here is making very, very small gold particles that then you can squeeze into tissue and you can get them to behave in just like gold nanoparticles. And that is, the, that, that is the challenge that a lot of people have been trying to solve. It's, it's very difficult to make this material, titanium nitride, into nanoparticle form. But that has been the contribution from my group in the last few years. We are developing new ways of making very nice and very small titanium nitride particles, uh, which then can be further engineered uh, to be inserted into tissue and to uh, be applied to rapid rewarming of tissue for, uh, for cryopreservation. Uh, so uh, just to recap my effort, uh, this is a highly collaborative project. My group is working very closely with the group of Professor Aguilar uh, because among the things that we don't know are really the optical properties of this material. Gold is very well characterized. The titanium nitrate is not, it's, it's a much newer material. So we are doing a lot of measurements in collaboration with the Aguilar group on really understanding how this material behaves from an optical point of view. We don't know how to assemble this material into small complex structures. And so we will start probably something with Professor Yin in chemistry to really look at the assembly of this material in, to improve functionality. And of course, the, the number of opportunities that this grant is opening to us is just, uh, it's just fantastic. We're going to collaborate with Berkeley, Minnesota. Uh, I graduated from the University of Minnesota myself, so I'm, I'm very well aware of their capabilities uh, collaborating with uh, the East Coast. I mean, it's just going to be fantastic. Uh, and so on that note, I'm, I'm wrapping up my short presentation and I'm going to uh, pass it on to uh, Yadong. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Lorenzo, and uh, I hope everyone can see my screen. Let me just uh, make it the uh, full screen. Okay, uh, so my group, uh, let me bring up the laser. Okay, so my group is working on nano warming uh, by using a very different method, and basically we're trying to uh, use nanoparticles, magnetic nanoparticles, to generate heat on the alternating magnetic field. And many of you probably have induction uh, cooktop uh, in your house and you place a, a metal pan on top of the induction uh, cooktop you 
uh, turn on the uh, electricity and the pan is going to be heated up. So what happens here is that uh, uh, there's a coil inside and, and you know, simplifying this <laughs> drawing. And uh, they, when you uh, uh, pass the AC current and then a uh, magnetic field will be generated. This magnetic field will induce a current in the matter that you put on top, okay? And then uh, the current is also alternating. And so that's why it generates heat, okay? So our, our idea is same uh, or similar. And, and, and basically we try to put magnetic particles uh, under this alternating magnetic field and then use magnetic particles to generate heat, okay? And it is, uh, uh, it is uh, doable and people have already uh, 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 published uh, uh, many papers about that and the particles can actually generate heat and, and uh, uh, under alternating magnetic field. So here is a, a magnetic particle, typical iron oxide, and the scale bar is 50 uh, nanometers. So they are very small, about 10 nanometers. Uh, to give you a sense how small they are, uh, if you believe this is five, uh, 50 nanometers and, and you have to have uh, 35,000 these screen lengths to make an inch. Okay, so that's, uh, <laughs> you, can, you can sense that they, they are very small. You cannot really see, see them by, by your eyes. So because they are very small and then you can introduce them into organs and, and uh, very conveniently by perfusion, okay, with some solvent, okay. And then you can, uh, once you introduce them into the organ, you can uh, vitrify the organ and you know, put them into liquid nitrogen, for example, and you can store them for a long time. Okay? And, and, and then when you, uh, at the time you want it, actually you can uh, uh, warm it up and, and this warming has to be very fast. So that's why we use uh, 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 electric field, uh, uh, magnetic field. We put the uh, organ in the alternating magnetic field so the particles are heated up uh, very rapidly and very uniformly, and then the uh, the organ can be uh, recovered. Okay, and uh, so suddenly this uh, 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 kind of idea has been uh, already explored, and this is actually the work done by uh, <coughs> research group in University of Florida, and they actually introduced this magnetic nanoparticle-based cryopreservation agent uh, into a rat uh, heart. And, and, and uh, so this, this, uh, this is the heart uh, field with this uh, uh, magnetic particles, okay? And then they uh, put under uh, uh, low temperature, uh, they require preserve it, and then they try to recover it. So as you can see that after recovering, uh, they, they can actually also remove the uh, magnetic particles. Okay, you can see that the, the, the uh, uh, heart is uh, uh, very live and uh, uh, they uh, can resolve the uh, function. And uh, uh, so they also tested how much uh, remaining uh, ion oxide is in the system. It's actually reduced significantly uh, from the uh, uh, original condition, okay? They also showed uh, field samples. So if you, if you don't really uh, put in nanoparticles, suddenly uh, the heart is gonna fail. And if you uh, put the nanoparticles in, but not in a uniform way, uh, you can also cause damage to the heart, okay? So uh, what we are gonna do in this project, my group is gonna contribute uh, in the uh, synthesis of better nanoparticles. And we try to improve the heating uh, uniformity and the heating rate, okay? So our efforts include two parts. Uh, one is the uh, synthesis of non-spherical magnetic particles, particularly ion oxide, okay? And uh, 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 in this case, you can see that we made the uh, 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 gamma phase ion oxide nanocubes and also uh, uh, Fe3O4 nanorods. This is called the magnetite. This is a magmite. And these two are basically two different phases of magnetic uh, materials, magnetic and oxide materials, okay? So why are we interested in these uh, uh, non-spherical particles? Just because uh, they can interact with the magnetic field in a different way than the traditional spherical particles so that they can offer significantly increased uh, heating efficiency by an order of magnitude. So they can heat up much faster than the spherical particles that we see in the previous slide, okay? 
And uh, uh, another effort uh, uh, is that uh, we're going to uh, make magnetic plasmonic hybrid nanoparticles. Okay, so the purpose is actually to allow simultaneous heating by light and magnetic field. So here are two examples. One example is the uh, dimer structures. You can see that in the uh, uh, schematic. This is an oxide particle. This is gold. And this is a real image uh, of the sample. The darker one is gold, and the lighter one is an oxide. Okay, so you have uh, these two always stay together, and and then uh, if you perfuse these particles into the organ, and then you can use uh, light and also the magnetic field to heat them up. So you can imagine the heating will be even faster. Okay, here's another example when we synthesize the hybrid particle, hybrid nanorods. So the darker one is gold and it's rod shape. And the lighter one here is an oxide, it's magnetic. And uh, we wrap them into a polymer shear so they become very stable, okay? So again, this also allows us to uh, uh, you know, heat, uh, heat particles uh, by uh, both light and magnetic field. So the rapid heating allows us to uh, 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 warm up uh, the uh, organs very fast at the same time, because you have two ways to heat the samples. And then uh, you can uh, make the heating more uniform throughout the uh, uh, different regions, okay? Okay, so the next, I would just let uh, uh, Professor Aguila uh, to talk about how to use light, how to control the light uh, for heating. Let me just uh, stop. Thank you. Uh, mm -hmm. So now let me Share my screen again. Okay, so just to bring this home. Um, um, so yeah, we're talking about the rapid and uniform rewarming of systems. And as my colleagues just explained to you, one of the goals here is to harm, to have not only a rapid, but also very uniform heating um, um, process so that we don't induce inadvertently some um, uh, mechanical uh, stresses that can damage the cells or the tissues. What you see here are just pictures of what, what is considered to be an ideal warming process versus an overheating process. Um, perhaps the difference is small, but here you see there's a, a, a mushy region that, that is an indication that there were some crystals that were formed and therefore uh, leading to non-viable, a um, non-viable system after the rewarming. Um, so there's different ways by which you can achieve this. One is the one that my colleagues have been telling you about already, where you have uh, gold nanoparticles or uh, with the development of the titanium nitride, you can have uh, those kind of nanoparticles helping you achieve these in a more uniform way, or for larger systems like the ones Dr. Yang just told you about, you want to have nanoparticles that can be uh, um, uh, activated through magnetic fields. One of the things that we do in my lab is try to, to optimize the laser delivery of, of um, laser light delivery to these systems. And particularly we're talking about small systems like uh, fish embryos, uh, very, very small. So in order to do that, um, like Dr. Mangolini just told you, we need to first characterize some of the particles that we're dealing with. So here's uh, some of the measurements that we've been doing in my lab, first using the, the gold standard, the gold nanoparticles that he described, but then also showing how um, that changes when we use the titanium nitride nanoparticles. And the goal here again is to have a, a combination of nanoparticles that can that can have that sweet spot between the absorption and the scattering that we need of that light to produce a very uniform heating. Uh, one of the uh, things that we have also proposed to do in the lab is to have what we call a beam splitting. And uh, some of my students, in fact, I think she's here uh, right now, uh, Crystal Alvarez and, and Carla uh, um, uh, Merospe, who's also one of our postdocs in the ERC, they have been working together to do precisely that. Take one beam from a laser, use a combination of, of beam splitters and mirrors to try to focus that, that beam from uh, multiple points. And the idea, just to, to go back to this, is that, that we 
uh, aim at the same target coming from at least four different points and produce a more uniform TV. Uh, we're well equipped to do this kind of thing. We have uh, obviously all the different uh, optical devices that we need, it, need for it, including a whole variety of laser systems that, that uh, we can use to achieve that. And then also at the bottom uh, is just some, some uh, uh, images of a paper of one of our colleagues who, who uh, um, uh, is not part of the ATP bio, but he's been collaborating with Professor Mangolini and I, who has been developing some uh, temperature sensors that are also a key component of this technology we're trying to develop. Because we need to know not only that we heat uniformly, but to what temperatures we do and, and in real time. So, um, so that's all, sort of the things that, that uh, we're also going to start looking into. And I already showed you this slide before. Um, I, I, get, I want to just close by saying uh, there's a variety of systems that we're going to be looking into. Uh, the combination of the laser heating and the magnetic heating, which is the specialty of UCR, is going to um, be integrated with the rest of the, of the uh, um, um, labs that are participating in the center and then tested across the different test beds uh, over the next five, hopefully even 10 years, uh, which is what an ERC typically lasts. So with that, I, I will stop here and, and then give it back to Jorge for, I guess, some uh, moderating of questions and answers. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Aguilar and Dr. Mangolini and, and Dr. Yin. Uh, really do appreciate you taking the time to um, provide such wonderful insight into the work and research that is taking place at the center. Um, we do have some questions from the audience. So let me go ahead and uh, start off with question one and um, let me go ahead and read it and see if there's someone in particular that wants to uh, take it. So it's, how will the, this research benefit people from, socio from all socioeconomic backgrounds? So how can this be applicable to, um, to I, I, it would be I, I, um, the, I don't know if it's the overall health or, or, or the warming mechanisms that, uh, that you are uh, describing. Um, well, I, let me try uh, to say something. And then of course, uh, uh, my colleagues are here to help as well. <laughs> uh, so sure, I, I, I think in, in many ways, uh, when we think about this suspended animation and, and the possibility of uh, freezing biological systems of this kind, and then rewarming them, we often think about uh, transplants, right? So yes, I guess in that sense, uh, it, it, we're really in, in an uh, uncharted territory. We're talking about uh, the, the uh, not just scientific and technological advances that need to be made, but also in a way that they're consistent with our uh, uh, laws, you know, with our uh, lots of ethical issues per pertaining to that precisely so that inadvertently we don't end up uh, affecting uh, groups such as say uh, uh, low socioeconomic uh, background people. But keep in mind what I said at the beginning when I introduced the center, this is not just meant to be a project that will help with organ transplants. It's much more than that. There's going to be very many uh, uh, different technologies that we expect to be developed as a result of all this work that will have impact in a whole variety of, um, of uh, businesses and a whole variety of, of uh, markets that affect people across the board, uh, left and right. And, and, and so um, I just want you to understand we don't really have a lot of the questions to this or a lot of these answers to these kind of questions yet. And I, I think even the, the, the people who have been working in these fields for a longer time still need to, to um, uh, work more and, and come up with, with the proper answers. Okay, thank you. I do have a, a, another question that was asked specifically for you, Dr. Aguilar, and then we can always um, allow Dr. Yin and Dr. Mangolini to um, respond to some of these other questions. But someone asked, can you please elaborate a bit more about the uh, nanoparticle synthesis? Um, 
I would defer then that one to my colleagues. Okay. Yeah, I, I can talk about it real quick. Um, uh, so that's that's another one of the things that we need to work on is, of course, you need to ensure biocompatibility. Uh, the preliminary data out there, they are already very promising. There are a handful of studies on titanium nitride, at least, on the biocompatibility of titanium nitride that it looks good, meaning that it should be biocompatible. Is it FDA approved? Of course not. Uh, we are a long way from uh, an FDA approval, uh, but at least the, the science seems to be pointing in the right direction. And, and maybe Yadon can talk a little bit more about the iron oxide, which I don't know much about, uh, about the biocompatibility of iron oxide. Yeah, iron oxide is already approved for use for medical uses. I think that's uh, that's an easy answer. And and on the other hand, I think all the particles are going to be, you know, capped with uh, biological polymers so that uh, you know they can be dispersed in the biological systems. And in that regard, it's also biocompatible. Thank you so much. Another question that was um, brought up is, um, can um, I don't know if it's uh, which one of you can respond to this, but how is it that these four institutions, right? So Berkeley, Minnesota, UC Riverside, and um, is it, um, what's, what's the fourth one? I, I don't recognize the, uh, the acronym. I know it's a health system. How did they, they, is it Massachusetts General? Yes. General, okay. How is it that um, all four of you came together for this project? And the other piece is, what role do corporate partnerships play in the research that is taking place? Well, okay, let me take a shot at the first question. So um, we came together because we knew each other for many years. Um, uh, Minnesota as a lead institution in this center is uh, well known for the work they've been doing for, for many years regarding uh, cryobiology uh, and cryopreservation. Uh, they, they have a very close connection with MGH, Massachusetts General Hospital. Um, and so it was a relatively easy match to make. They, they too had been working in, in these kind of areas. Um, Berkeley, in fact, well, they, they have been working on that. Berkeley happens to be the sort of the godfather of everything related to cryobiology and, and cryopreservation. A lot of, uh, of former students from Berkeley were the ones who went on to MGH and Minnesota and others, mm -hmm. and they developed their own careers. And now they're very, very uh, mature scientists who have essentially put their work together to, to make these kind of things happen. Um, I personally had a, a, a good relationship with one of the leaders in this in this uh, 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 effort. In fact, with the with the director of the ERC, we had been uh, working together, although we had never published or or done anything uh, uh, scientific. But we had been in touch because we belong to the same kind of of group of uh, bio heat transfer in a very general sense. And so I was aware of what they were doing. They were aware of what I was doing. And then like Lorenzo described, he was also a, a former uh, student at Minnesota. So he also had that connection. And then Yadong and, and, and uh, John Bishop, who's the director, they also have, happened to know each other because of the work they were doing. So in that slide that I showed where there were very many connectivities between, it's truly because we knew each other in one way, shape or form for many, many years. And, and I think that's really key to the success of not just DCRC, but many other uh, uh, large scale um, uh, projects like this. You have to have those connectivities and that kind of track record going for you before you actually can propose something and, and, and be credible uh, when you do. That's a terrific response. Thank you so much. So it goes back to the relationships that you have, knowing who the strong players are in the field and then putting together a proposal that will look attractive to be funded. That's right. Um, and then with, re with regards to the second question, so what is the role of the corporate partners? Well, so at first, obviously, they, they, they had to, to show uh, a, a decisive interest in, in participating uh, in this ERC, in even sponsoring, there was some some uh, level of sponsorship in kind and also in cash. Um, at the same time, though, I know all the uh, even though I don't know the details, I know there was a lot of work done 
in advance to make sure that there were no conflicts of interest uh, with these uh, uh, um, partners. They, they are here to be supportive and perhaps uh, give opportunities to students and, and, let, um, uh, and, and, and let some of the researchers make use of their facilities, uh, these kind of things. Um, and they may have a, a right to first refusal if there's any kind of, uh, of uh, uh, intellectual property that is generated through this. All of these kind of guidelines were, were worked out in, with the participation of, of many people. I wasn't part of those discussions, so I can't really give you more details. But I think it's fair to say that obviously they have a vested interest and, uh, and they're supporting the efforts for, for, uh, for uh, good reasons. That's great, thank you. I know that you mentioned in your earlier slides that um, you know part of the concern or part of the things that you're trying to measure is not only how quickly, but to what temperature um, you're able to get the, the heating mechanism to go. So is there a way um, to slow it down to either slow down the, the, the heating component or um, make it such that you don't overheat? Or is it just trial and error until you figure out some kind of a formulation or combination to get it to the optimal heat level they're trying to reach? Well, let me tell you from the perspective of the optical point of view, and then maybe uh, Yadon can say more about the magnetic one. From the, from the opti optical point of view, yes, I guess we can have some sort of prediction of what are the maximum temperatures we're going to reach based on the volume of the system, perhaps the concentration of the nanoparticles that we have previously infused, all of that. But to be frank, a lot of the models that we use for those kind of predictions make a lot of assumptions. So at the end of the day, we're gonna to have to test this and corroborate this with experimentation and then fine tune it in a way that we, you know, obviously matches with the model and the predictions we have. At the mag magnetic level, it's a different scale. I suppose same kind of uh, considerations come into play, but uh, I'll let uh, Yadon chime in. Yeah, I think uh, essentially it's the same thing, uh, but uh, for magnetic particles, uh, the problem is, uh, you know, the heating is slow, not too, too fast. <laughs> so, so we're always trying to make it a faster, you know, heating, and we're trying to develop the materials for that purpose. Great, thank you. Well, I'm doing a time check. I know we have uh, four minutes left before I have to wrap up. So just wanted to um, take this opportunity to thank all of you again for carving time out of your busy schedules. I, I know that uh, this is something that we've all been looking forward to hearing about the exciting research that is taking place at, at UCR. The creation of this center adds to that. So again, thank you for the terrific presentation. We're all looking forward to what you and your partners at different institutions are going to be collaborating on uh, and, and uh, are looking forward to hearing about these uh, breakthroughs that will take place as a result of, um, of the work that y'all are doing. We know that um, cryomedicine is something that is, and cryobiology is something that's very exciting. Um, I know we, we, we've heard about, um, some of the research that is taking place. Glad to hear that um, UCR is a strong partner in this field. So, so congratulations to the three of you on being part of this larger consortium um, receiving this funding. I'd like Thank to you. Uh, not only our participants, but all of you who are joining us uh, this evening. Again, just a, a quick reminder that we have some uh, other activities that will be coming up. So um, on April 12th, we do have our UCR expert series, which is uh, investing for beginners. Uh, may not necessarily apply to this audience, but you never know, especially if some of our um, faculty members are successful in patenting some of the research that they're doing. Um, and then also just wanted to um, just quickly share that um, on April 18th through the 24th, we do have our Highlander Week of Service. Uh, because of the pandemic, it's, it's looking a little bit different, meaning that we're encouraging individuals to engage in projects that um, they want to uh, participate in, uh, either with members of their household or as individuals. Uh, and um, just giving back to your community wherever it is that you are located. Again, thank you so much for joining us this evening. We hope that you enjoyed tonight's presentation and we look forward to seeing you at an upcoming event. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye.